Welcome back to Intelligent Empathy. Today, things get real because we're looking at sensing, and this has to do with people who are focused on concrete reality. We're going to be looking at four different categories, personalities with extroverted and introverted charges, as well as masculine and feminine charges. For masculine functions, these are functions which are very tangible, concrete, have hard edges, and they're very clear, whereas the feminine flexible functions tend to have a lot more give and and have the capacity for a lot more nuance. Remember that if you have an introverted and masculine function on one side, that means you have an extroverted and feminine function on the other side. So if someone has an introverted masculine sensing, that means they have an extroverted feminine intuition. If they have a introverted feminine sensing, that means that they have an extroverted masculine intuition. These are going to be our savior extroverted masculine sensors. So they're going to be dealing with the external world in an extroverted way, which means it's not going to be as personal. It's going to be chaos over control. So they're going to be much more comfortable with things just kind of going wherever they may. They're not necessarily trying to control their physical environment as much. Their function is going to be more masculine. So their understanding of physical reality is going to be fairly well defined. These are our savior feminine extroverted sensors. So they're also just pulling in information from reality and just kind of processing what's going on around them. They're doing it in a a feminine or flexible kind of way. So that means that they're going to have a lot more capacity for nuance in their understanding of what is. These are our savior masculine introverted sensors. So they're going to be dealing with ordering and structuring physical reality. They're going to be order over chaos. And so a lot of conceptual chaos is going to be throwing them off. And they're going to be very concrete and clear in their understanding of what physical reality is. These are our feminine introverted sensors. So these are people who are organizing physical reality, but they're doing so with a lot of appreciation and space for nuance. These are people who are going to be aware of and maybe thrown off by conceptual chaos. And we're going to start with Morgan Freeman. Please welcome Morgan Freeman. Did you ever consider politics or anything like that? No, Stephen, I never did consider politics. I'm an actor. Now, how do you think it compares, like, the real Washington in your mind? Uh, today, I don't think it compares at all. Do you crack the whip or do you drive the people really hard? I drive the crew. The actors I don't fool around with because they're, they know what they're doing. Crews tend to get a bit complacent, and I remind them that a NASCAR pit crew can change four tires and give you a tank of gas in under 14 seconds. If, if, if I feel like they're taking too long to change a light, or I go zing, zing, zing. Gentle and yet hostile at the same time. The mission is just to show us who we are, and humanity to humanity. And it seems like this might not be a bad time to be airing such a show, mm -hmm. because we think we're splitting apart. We're not. Life moves in waves. It's almost predictable what's going to be happening a thousand years from now with us. Ten countries on this trip. Is there one place where you learned more about us than other countries? Can I say that? I wouldn't say that, but South, Southern Ethiopia, a tribe of people called the Hammer. 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 Like Hammer. The Hammer. Yeah. <laughs> they live there in the Omo Valley, just as they did hundreds of years ago. Bull jumping ceremony. He jumps over a bunch of bulls. He doesn't really jump over them. He just runs over, runs along them. Chris. It is dangerous. Yes. All of the females and his family, and they may number in the teens, come out to support him. They have nine men selected, I forget what they call them, whip these women. So the boy is running along the backs of the He's going bulls. to. It, this is all built up to the moment when he's going to do that. It doesn't quite go like this. You just said, him. you just said is whipping. They do, they do. They just nine men, and they're over here in the shade somewhere, and these ladies are jumping up and down. They wear these bells on their legs, so you're going to ching, ching. Ding, 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 and they jump up and down and they're having fun. Yeah. And they'll go over and they will insult a man to take this whip and give me a good lick. So the man will take the whip and go out into the middle of this circle and it goes right across there. And the women don't even flinch. I was, I want to say enthralled, but it doesn't sound right, Al. What do you, but what did you learn from it, I guess, is what? Don't do that. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Dwayne Johnson. And, and who's Dewey? 
God, that, my mom embarrassed me on national TV a couple of days ago, and uh, she revealed, live, by the way, she revealed that one of my nicknames when I was a kid was Dewey, when I was a baby. And how that happened was uh, I was, um, she asked my godmother, oh, is, is his diaper wet? And she went, eh, it's a little Dewey. <laughs> that was it. And my grandfather wrestled for Vince McMahon's dad in the 70s, and my dad wrestled for Vince McMahon in the 80s, and I came along in the 90s and early 2000s and wrestled for Vince McMahon. And my grandmother uh, wound up being the first uh, female wrestling promoter uh, in the history of wrestling. It was very cool. And she was a badass, too, by the way. Yeah. She, uh, she was on the larger side. Okay. Uh, there's a joke that most Polynesians are 250 pounds, and the women are even bigger. Uh, <laughs> the idea that wrestling was a show was always protected. So as far as she knew, it was real and there was going to be a fight down at this local arena in San Francisco where he first started. So he brings her to the first match. She's sitting there and he has the match and the match starts and he, of course, starts getting beat up at some point. She jumps in the ring. <laughs> I swear to God. She jumps in the ring, takes her clogs off and starts beating his ass in the ring. The opponent, and then my grandfather had to yell at her in Samoan, like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, no, he's my friend. And she, he grabbed her, took her out, and put her back in the seat. And the crowd was like, what is happening right now? Wait. In very interesting relationship, very loving. Gal Gadot. I, I'm, okay. I'm, I, I know of you. Okay. No, you're Wonder Woman. Yeah. It this seems is a, to be. This is a big, <laughs> this is a big deal. You know, it's just I wake up every morning telling myself, no. <laughs> Giant billboard in Times Square that's I bigger know. than... We went there last night. Did you really? We just got here last night. We went straight to Times Square, and it was just surreal. I'm from Israel, from this small city, and all of a sudden I'm all over <sighs> Times Square. It's just, it's insane. Okay. Um, no, but I had so many almost, and another camera test, and it was almost mine, and another roll, and another roll, and then I, and I was like telling my husband, I'm not sure how long I can take it. And I got a phone call from Zack Snyder, who wanted to audition me for this secret role. Secret I was role. like, okay, sure. Well, you know, I'll do that. What, what does that mean? You, you have know no what idea what, what the story is about, who's the character. What are you Nothing. saying? What are the lines? What are you... Back to Israel to shoot an Israeli movie, and I didn't know if I want to, wanted to continue acting afterwards. I'm like, again, camera test, again, another, almost, almost. All right, so you're ready. And you're then I'm like, okay, up for rejection. whatever. What am I being testing for? Hey, What's I... the big deal? What, is, what am God? I? Yeah, who am I? Yeah. So anyway, Zach called me two days later, and he's like, I don't know if you have this character in Israel, if she's big or not, but did you ever? hear about Wonder Woman. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Wonder Woman, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll be there. I'm like calling That's them. Good news, I know. forgot about that. I've been waiting for six weeks. I already think that the part is not mine. <laughs> I was sitting this entire flight. It's a long flight, 15 hours from Tel Aviv to Los Angeles. Sure. I was sitting next to this professor. He tried, tried really hard to teach me about the quantum theory. <laughs> Super interesting, though very complicated. He, I'm what? still working he wanted on it. To talk to you about Actually, pretty interesting. Oh, I would put but fake headphones on. Anything. I would go. I'm so. Call my agent. The part is yours. You wonder what. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! And this guy is next to me, and everyone are looking at me like it was a lot louder. I sounded no. Nah. It was oh, yeah. it was my <laughs> masculine voice. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so excited to be here that I've been talking nonstop. No. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton, how are you? I'm fine. We've never met before, but I I, I've that. seen you. We do a lot of road shows, and I want you to know, though, that I am so excited today because today's my birthday, and I couldn't think of That's a nice happy <laughs> No, Champagne I, stuff. Do you drink it all? Oh, I drink a little if it's for my birthday. I'm just like a kid. I love gifts. I love excitement. And everybody in my band remembered my birthday, and they all got me a card and a little gift. That makes you feel real special. Yeah. Because I told them yesterday better. <laughs> <laughs> People in country music have treated me great, and I love country music. And of course, I have. Uh, it's the biggest selling music in this in this country, isn't it? Country and western. Well, I know it's it's mighty big, but I, I think uh, the country music is music with a lot of class and a lot of soul. And of course, it's it's just ordinary stories told by ordinary people and sometimes in an extraordinary way. Yeah. You know, right in the, at the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountain National uh, Park. They have a resort area. It's a little place called Gatlinburg and they have a ski resort and yeah. all that. And I understand they have enough snow this winter to last for about three or four years. I lived there until I was 18 years old. Well, my daddy was a farmer and I'm from a large family. In fact, there's 12 of us kids. 12? Six girls and six boys. And uh, of course we were just... Wow. Uh, farm folks. We lived on a farm all my life. Really pretty sisters. Some of them were yeah. 
petite, some of them are bigger, and I'm the fat one. Well, you're not fat. <laughs> I'm good and healthy. <laughs> yeah. I like my clothes to be gaudy, and you'd never know by looking, but uh, there's very little money made in the country, and right. our main money was uh, our tobacco <coughs> crop. But a lot of people had more kids than that uh, one year's tobacco crop would uh, so supply. So they were kind of so, forced into... Yeah, of course, a lot of them did enjoy their work. <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee or Kentucky moonshine? I've tasted it. I, I don't like the taste of it. Yeah. It's real strong. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that's what it's meant to be. Curtis Jackson. Let's please welcome Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. <laughs> That was, you know, there was, oh, what's her name? Sharon Osbourne gave me that nickname. 50 Cent. That's how she says it. Like, it's 50 Cent. She said 50 Cent. And it's been that ever since. So it's Curtis Jackson. I put Curtis 50 Cent Jackson. Okay. So people don't come expecting what they would see from me as a musical artist. Is there a difference in the personality between Curtis Jackson and 50 Cent? Yeah, well, Curtis Jackson is my grandmother's child. That's when I clean up. When I clean up. This is Curtis. This is Curtis. And here's 50. <laughs> This is it, man. This is the... Okay. This is the Casper mattress doing good suit. To be honest, I think it was like an accident. I think he was trying to get a, a, a great renegotiation for The Apprentice. He, he wanted say, to lose I'm the so presidency. Famous. He don't want the job. Well, then when you win, you go, what the <laughs> <laughs> So now... I, so now I gotta be the president? <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, man. That was my reaction, too. You know, like, he does things, and I recognize the things while he's doing What do you mean? Like, recently, he was saying something like, you know, I got a bigger nuclear butt. That's, like, stuff you do in the neighborhood. Like, if you know somebody got a problem with you, you'd be like, if you, you want a problem, no problem. You bluff. But you don't bluff with the, the entire world. <laughs> what the Because he don't want that smoke. We don't want that smoke. Like, none of us. You no. don't want that to take place, but mm -hmm. he's like, yo, I got a bigger nuclear button than you. Mm -hmm. That's like saying, you know, I got a bigger Johnson than yours. I don't know if we can say Johnson on CBS. <laughs> that was the cleanest version of it I had. Post Malone. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna go to bed. I'm tired. And you go, no, come on, man. Yeah, that's and then we went out. Yes, sir. It was great. We didn't tell him we were coming or anything. No, it was incredible. It was a good time. Dude, we shut the place down. We shut it down. We sang some Irish folk songs. Do you know Thank a lot God of Irish folk songs? It was fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You're a talented individual. I learned uh, that, as everyone probably knows who knows me, I'm a, the biggest Bud Light advocate in the whole universe. You really are. We came out this year and with Sublime as the band, and Fat Joe came out. And I can't was, believe that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, so I guess, you know, hopefully we'll get to do a third one if they still like me, and then... Um, <laughs> You yeah, know, we can do. just run around and do do shows, and I get to sing songs for people who want to hear them, and I think that's pretty uh, pretty cool. It is. You know, there's a it's a long process that goes into it, but you know, finally towards the end we kind of rallied and just made it work, which is exciting for me. When you usually I just go in and have a abnormal amount of Bud Light and go into the. <laughs> Uh, booth and just kind of sing over beats and wait until I find a good melody and then sit down and write it so and we've done that probably a hundred times and then just shift through them and then see which ones are smush hits very fresh type stuff I've probably used the adjective fresh for every single album or oh. song that I've ever well, put out Jennifer Lawrence please welcome Jennifer Lawrence <laughs> You took over when Jimmy Kimmel was out in yeah. November. It's not as easy as it looks, is it? Uh, pretty easy. Not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> there's a clock behind her head, so if she's talking, you know, just try to wrap it up. Well, there's a clock you know, behind like her head. Like a five minute, like a commercial thing. Like, right, like right over here? Wait. There's a clock. There's a, yeah, look Honestly out the God, window. <laughs> yeah, there's um, a clock right behind her? There was a clock, that, and they were like, when she gets to the end, or when it, when it starts counting down, wrap it up, we'll go to a commercial. Okay. And I was like, got it. And then we're in the middle of the interview and she's just shooting me down like a congresswoman. And I'm out of questions. And the clock's like five minutes. And I'm like, do you wear like socks to sleep? Or like, I didn't know what to ask. Hey, Is you... this mine? Let's find out. Okay. Um, would you like a drink? Okay. Sure. Really? I've never we done not this plan before. This. How does this? This will help bring my soul back. I know it. There. Cool. Thank you so much. I don't know. I'm going to be developing things and talking to kids about. You know, corruption. Wait, wait, what? 
I'm a part of an organization that's trying to pass state by state legislation to get big money out of politics. So I go to this high school, I go to this high school to like talk to kids about, you know, the government and super PACs and blah, blah, blah. You know, when Trump got elected, my head spun off and I read all these books and I've like really learned myself good, like comparing our economic you system learned up, you learned to Sweden's good. and Norway's yeah. trust in their government versus America's trust in their government. Everything. Educated myself fully. Sure. Fly to Ohio, go to a high school. First question, I was like, um, I don't, I, I don't know. The kid, the kid <laughs> they were so you. smart, yeah. Well, I can't go to colleges anymore. I'm gonna start getting toddlers into politics. <laughs> Thing I'd What's ever your seen. wedding guest vibe? What do you like at the wedding? Flirting with Larry David all night, but it was very one-sided. And then Amy... What? What do you mean? I, I'm obsessed with Larry David. He wasn't flirting back? He's not obsessed with me, no. He's dead. Um, ceremony, Amy comes up and grabs me, and she's like, let's go upstairs and you know, like talk about like life and love and like this giant decision that she just made. And we go up to the roof, and we're just like... She's like talking about everything, and I just went, Amy, every minute that I'm here, Larry could be leaving. And she was like, you are an unending ass, but go downstairs. Emma Chamberlain. Today on The Colin and Samir Show, we're joined by Emma Chamberlain. From 2017 to 2021, she uploaded for 55 months straight, an average of four videos per month. Since then, Emma has posted a lot less frequently, and this year alone, she's only uploaded three videos. What is your relationship to YouTube right now? I feel like it's a loving relationship, but such a complex relationship with it. I wish that our relationship clicked for me right now, but it doesn't, but I love to be here when I'm here. Do you feel like when you're watching YouTube now, you're watching from an insider's perspective or do you- Maybe I'm completely delusional, but it still feels like I'm in it. Yeah. I think once you are in it deep once, you're in it forever. You can never escape it. Like it changed my brain. I will never see the platform the same. I don't yeah. think, Yeah. you know? Your first video ever, which is on Billy Billy, a Chinese <laughs> version of YouTube. Do you know that? Really? Yeah. City, like whatever oh, it's called, God. is on Billy Billy. Oh my God, I hope the it has three views. <laughs> All they know you By have, the yeah. way, that video is iconic. <laughs> yeah. I was trendsetting. Yeah, no, I wasn't. It was weird. Did have this like unbelievable confidence to speak to a lens. What evolution are you in right now? I'm trying to pinpoint it myself because I think what's happening is creatively, I'm due for a shift, but one bigger than I had ever experienced prior. Like I'm really hungry for something really different. My last few videos that were a bit more artsy, they were a bit more cinematic, more about creating a feeling I think than anything. But then that didn't work for me. That format didn't allow my personality to come out and I felt like my personality wasn't coming out anymore. That was the most recent phase. That worked for a second, now it's not working. Not being sure what the next creatively fulfilling thing will be, combined with the uncertainty of who I am as an adult. There's a whole lot of question marks. To me, it's exciting. Like, I'm not worried about it, but what I've figured out is that I cannot rush it. You know, this industry is like obsessed with speed. I need to pull back in a way that everyone will look and be like, well, she's quitting. And I have to be okay with that. Mm. I know that I can't be a vlogger forever. I just can't. And I don't want to do that. I think in order to, dis to, to figure out what the next thing is, I have to give myself that time to figure it out. Okay, that was a lot. Nice job. Go ahead and gather your thoughts on some of the things that you saw. That was all extroverted sensing. So those were people who were probably more chaos over control. Think about the differences between the more masculine extroverted sensors and the more feminine extroverted extroverted sensors, what was their clarity on reality and patterns, and what was their awareness of control versus chaos. Next, we're going to be looking at the introverted sensors. So these are going to be people who were more focused on understanding and organizing physical reality. We're going to start with these introverted masculine sensors and these feminine introverted sensors, starting with Ray Romano. Please welcome Ray Romano. And I just worked in Vegas. I love working there. You work uh, at the Mirage there, right? I did. I was there yesterday. I flew back yesterday and uh, had some fun. What do you Good do? Good fun, what? clean, you know. Clean fun? Uh, you know, the museum. <laughs> Which the one? Zoo. We went to the zoo. <laughs> Here's the thing about a zoo. When that stupid kid falls in the gorilla pit, uh -huh. the, the gorillas are going, we're going to get shot in the head now, aren't we? We're gonna... <laughs> 
He's really a good you, kid. You were very kind to my son. He worked here for a number of years, and uh, he's he's moved on a yeah. little. Yeah. Um, he's actually getting married. He's getting married in uh, April. Um, you know, even here, there's a picture of him. Can we show that picture of when he worked here? Look at that. There How he is. was that kid going to get married? Look how hard you tried to keep him a virgin. She probably. <laughs> I don't. I don't think she's seen that. I think I have one. One left. My one youngest left. is still left, but it's a big house, so we don't see him a lot. <laughs> 12.30 in the afternoon. So, you know, I, I'm not even going to tell you how long I'm married. Here's what I'll do. I'll tell you what happens now. She said this to me the other day. I'm quoting my wife. Uh, uh, you don't talk a lot, but when you do, it's too much. Here's another one. Uh, the other day I woke up, I went in the bathroom, and my wife's brushing her teeth, and I walk in and she turns to me and goes, another thing that pisses me off. She's already, it's already on. But I annoy her. I, I sleep with a flashlight. I have to tell you this story, okay? Because <laughs> you're not as old as me, but we're both. But I, I sleep with a little flashlight. It's, it's like this big, and it's got a strap. I love it, right? I read. But the other, a couple weeks ago, so I fall asleep reading. I wake up, I can't find it. OK, so you, you, I'm like a crazy man. I'm in my underwear running around. I'm obsessed now. I got to find this. And she gets mad at me and my wife. You know, she's like, let it go. And I can't let it go. And then my agent calls, and I start telling him about it. When you make somebody a lot of money, they have to listen to your disappearing <laughs> flashlight. <Yeah. laughs> he's pretending he's into it. Did you check the pillowcase? Of course I checked the pillowcase. All right. And then I stop and I go, wait a minute, I think I found it. Because I look down and hanging out of the underwear is the strap. <laughs> Listen to me, for 20 minutes, I'm freaking out. What kind of old man numb ball disease do I have? <laughs> Am I wrong? Am I wrong to be, to be weirded out no, by yes, it? You should... I'll bet there's things you could find in your underwear and be able to shrug it off, you know? <laughs> like, well, oh, a nickel hey, or a Cheerio. How'd a Cheerio get in my thing? <laughs> But a flashlight, a flashlight. Anderson Cooper. How was your weekend? Uh, my weekend, you know, it was fine. It was weird, though, because, you know, the president started tweeting at, like, 6.50 something a.m. 6.35. Right, and I've actually muted the president on Twitter. Don't tell him. What? I've muted him. You can do that? Ooh. So if you just mute them, they think you're still following them, <laughs> and, and you don't actually see their tweets. And I get back on Sunday and I finally like turn on my phone again. I'm like, what the, what, what? I, I, you know, and then I was like, Look, I have people following him. So they tell me what, it, I just don't want to have that drama in my life. I don't want the ups and the downs in my life. You I just want to be line, calm. You have a private line. It's, I mean, it's like a Rorschach. It, it's a, uh, you know, those, those uh, machines that register earthquakes from a great distance. This is like a real a seismograph. Seismic. This is like a real time seismograph of the inner workings of the president's head, and it's fascinating. We had to wait his for... His emotions. It's his emotional seismograph. Yes, it's an seismograph. emotional seismograph. We had to... He's like a live wire of emotion. We had to wait for decades to hear Nixon on tapes. We hear Donald Trump in real time. The thing is, Donald Trump watches CNN, which is why he talks about it so much, because he actually watches it, and even when he's railing against it, he's watching it. I've had him watch my show and tweet about people I'm interviewing while I'm interviewing them. Oh, that guy is a jerk, Anderson Cooper's interviewing, what a waste. Things like that, while you're interviewing him. It's, it's very strange. Wow. I didn't have a great relationship with the Obama White House. I used to interview President Obama on the campaign trail before he became president, a couple times as president. I did a reporting on the BP oil spill. I spent two months in New Orleans straight just doing nothing but BP oil spill basically every night. I didn't get to, you know, I didn't have a great relationship. I didn't really have any relationship. I also don't want to really have a relationship with these people. Like I interviewed Kellyanne Conway a couple weeks ago, probably maybe my last interview with her ever, I don't know. And at one point in the interview, she said something to me along the lines of like, you know, we may have to rethink the relationship we have. I was like, we don't have a relationship. <laughs> and, I, and I don't, I mean, no offense. And I said like, look, I respect you and stuff, but I don't want to have a relationship with you. I don't want to be friends. I don't want to hang out. I, I don't believe reporters should be going to like parties at the White House. What about or, the correspondence? I, I've went once. I will never go again. What, you're just Taylor Tomlinson. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, every person I've ever met, I think, texted me, besides like three, which are the three you remember. Sure. I don't know, when you got your show, was it like that? Were I'll never like, forgive them. You'll never forgive them. No. Dead to me, exactly. right? Exactly, 100%. Yeah, yeah, if my sixth grade teacher can remember to text me, so can you, my ex's mom. Like, I don't... <laughs> are you excited about uh, the prospect of uh, the famous people? I want to keep my cool. I will say, my sister and I saw Merrily We Roll Along last night when we flew in. On Broadway here, On yeah. Broadway here, which Fantastic. is Fantastic. My agents were like, do you want us to try 
to get a chance for you to meet Daniel Radcliffe after, because we know you loved Harry Potter growing up. No, because I'll cry. But I was like, you know what, Taylor? You got to get better at this. You're about to be on a late night show. They're going to have big guests coming through. Like, be cool. And we went in. We kept it short and sweet. I didn't say anything crazy. I didn't try to touch his face. I wasn't like, you got me through fifth grade. <laughs> That's why I like comedy, because if you show up even look... Do you know how many people told me I look fantastic tonight? Because they expect so little of a comedian. Uh, we did over 130 shows. I think we did around 135, 140. Tour. Yeah. Do you have it all? I mean, it depends who you ask, I guess. Like, I'm, asking, it's, I'm asking you. I mean, right now, I feel like I definitely do. But, you know, when you're, when you're 12 years old, you have different expectations of how your life's gonna go. So I always say, you know, like, yeah, I thought by 30 I'd be married and have kids, and instead all I have are three Netflix specials and a late-night show. So it's been... <laughs> You'll get Devastating. there. You'll get there. It's been hard. You started off in the Christian comedy circuits that are out of your repertoire. Well, you know, we called it testimony, but I was getting laughs. And I, I got fired from my last church gig because I tweeted a joke with innuendo in it. Their team called me after I tweeted this joke and were like, hey, we just, you know, we think you're great, but we can't have any sort of suggestive material out there uh, coming from you. So the joke that eventually I ended up doing on television on Late Night So It Worked Out was, um, I'm like a wild animal in bed, way more afraid of you than you are of me. No, there wow. was no, like, change your ways, or it was like... So there's yeah, no we're... forgiveness in Christian comedy. No, 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 comedy. no, they... <laughs> Elizabeth Olsen. Elizabeth Olsen. Did you know when you were making it that you were part of something genre-breaking? We loved what we were doing. We had so much fun doing it, but we really felt like it was either gonna potentially ruin us all. <laughs> but it, I think that's the stuff that feels the most fun to make is when you feel like you could fail at any second. Yes. Yeah, the writing was really beautiful. I think it touched on the way we grieve, but then it became this huge set piece. You couldn't stop laughing when they would hoist you up on the wire. Yes, yes. Well, Have... because your stomach leaves you. It's like, I guess, the joy people get on roller coasters, which I don't get, but people love that feeling. Movies since then. I've done so many Marvel movies. <laughs> uh, I've definitely recovered from my giddiness. Sometimes I'm just like, okay, how many more of these? Do you, do you want? I can do this all day, kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but sometimes I get a little freaked out. There is one in Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, where I had to be dropped from 30 feet up so that it looked like it had an impact, but it kept landing like like Peter Pan, like kind of like fencing. And they used it. Yeah, and I look and I look like Peter Pan. <laughs> like, I look like I'm fencing. It's ridiculous. And I didn't do all of them, but I did most of them, which is a waste of everyone's time because a stunt double does it so much. Do you remember the ending of Witches of Eastwick with Jack Nicholson covered in feathers? Yeah. I was just waiting for that moment. I was wet, I was covered in oil, I was covered in blood constantly. And I was like, at what point are we just gonna blow feathers on me? Cause this is getting ridiculous. Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> I've been a fan of yours since 1994, back when you were named Stephen Colbert. Oh, oh, it's it's Kentucky Kentucky. Whiskey. Uh, Wild Turkey came to me, wanted me to be uh, sort of the face of the brand. All right, we, we went down, went to Kentucky, hung out with them, and I, and I went to Eddie Russell. It was the Jimmy's son, well, Jimmy Russell is. And I went to Jimmy, who's the Buddha of bourbon, and, I, and he says, well, Matthew, you know, if it doesn't work, we're just gonna be stuck with a whole lot of bourbon. <laughs> There's worse things to be stuck with. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hey. If, if, if you're really honest about how you feel in a romantic comedy, you sink the ship, man. The ship. You gotta bounce along the clouds in romantic comedies. I mean, you can't love as hard, get mad as hard, hate as hard, or laugh as hard in those things. Now, in a drama, you hang your hat on humanity at every single turn. You sit there and go, how do I feel about that? And across the top, it's all Saturdays, all on a, on a rom-com. <laughs> But that's what I mean. This is big summer fun blockbuster stuff from Stephen King. This is the mythic uh, good versus evil. Mm -hmm. And Idris Elba is the, uh, uh, the knight, uh, Roland, the gunslinger. And mm -hmm. he's been, I've had him chasing me for thousands of years in this multi-universe place that we are. And, all right, and the tower's the vortex that holds the universe together. Sure, all right? Yeah, sure, hold on. I want to bring on, that tower train, down. All right? Yeah. I'm going to bring it down. He wants to keep it up. Can he do that? He's got to get rid of me first. I don't know. You got to see the movie. I don't think he's going to do it. And he, and Mike Pence. Well, first, let me say I'm, I'm taken aback at the idea of indicting a former president of the United States at a, at a time when there's a crime wave in New York City that the last five years, the Democrats have been dismantling 
uh, tough criminal justice, this is what we get. It just feels like a politically charged prosecution here. Uh, not what the American people want to see. We got real challenges in this country today, John. We, people are facing record inflation, a crisis at our border. We have war in Eastern Europe. The American people are anxious about the future. And uh, here we go again. Brene Brown. I think when we think leader, we think like pinstripes and shoulder pads and the C-suite office. And the truth is I've been in those offices and couldn't find a leader to save my life. And I've been around everyday people that would never identify as a leader and been surrounded by them. So I define a leader as any person who holds themselves accountable for finding the potential in people and processes and has the courage, the guts to develop that potential. I recently asked John Meacham, I said, what would you say to people who don't think they're leaders? He said, then you don't understand democracy. We all have to lead. What are a few patterns that you always see showing up in good leaders? We ask, what's the future of leadership? Who's gonna be leading in five years, 10 years, and who's going to be gone? And the answer was, we need braver leaders. And so when we drilled into what does that mean? I mean, I love the word brave. I love the word courage, but they're gauzy. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. It came down to four skill sets. The ability to rumble with vulnerability. The, you know, that means when things get uncertain and hard, we don't tap out. We don't tap out of hard conversations. We don't tap out of feedback, giving it or receiving it. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that we really learn how to live into our values. I mean, the most daring leaders we've talked to are very clear, not only about what their values are, but also what the behaviors are that support those values. Like if I walk into another organization and see an integrity poster with an eagle, ha! what does that mean? <laughs> I don't the third thing is building trust. And the last one is huge. You've got to know how to reset after failure, disappointment, wow. and setbacks. You got Maggie Gyllenhaal. Maggie Gyllenhaal. <laughs> when did you say, okay, I'm going to be a director? Now that I've made a film, I realize I was always a director. And when I was acting, I mean, I love acting, and it's been a long time. I mean, it was since The Deuce. I haven't acted in anything. But I was always banging up against something, wanting more than I was able to express as an actress. That supposedly Meryl Streep said, I don't know if she did, she'll tell us now, probably, sure. if we say it on Colbert. If you're an actress and you have an idea and you need it in order to get your work done, offer it up with a spoonful of sugar. It's a lot of work. The sugar part. Yeah, the sugar part. And you probably get, what, 40% of what it is you wanted to express actually in the film, whereas mm -hmm. as a director, it's all in there. It's scary to have it all out there, but it also feels great because it is what I meant to say. One woman's ambivalence about her role as a mother. Yeah. You don't see that depicted. Lots of thoughts about this. When we're little, our survival depends on our parents, and maybe in particular our mothers, mm -hmm. because they're feeding us from their bodies. Mm -hmm. our, our fantasy that they want nothing more than to take care of us. Mm -hmm. Because our, very, our actual survival depends on it, when in fact, they're us. They like also want to have a drink sometimes, and mm -hmm. want a night with their husband or wife. They also want to work, and they want men like we do. And to be away from you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a part of us that can barely bear to acknowledge that, that parenthood, no matter what, includes ambivalence. It's a, it's a very complicated experience. Right? If it doesn't fit inside this very narrow space that we've agreed we're allowed to talk about, then they say something's wrong with you. Nice job. Okay, we've absorbed a lot of information. Go ahead and gather your thoughts, take some notes, think about the differences between the introverts and the extroverts, and any patterns that you noticed between the two genders. Here is your moment of zen.
All right, here's some things that I noticed. The Save Your Masculine Extroverted Sensors seem to be very easygoing, comfortable with how the world is. They came across as very confident. They seem to live in the world, but they didn't internalize it. What happened in the world was not connected to their identity or an internal awareness of things. They simply inhabited the world. There were a lot of real life stories, real world stories with lots of specific examples. I was here. I did this thing. I was talking to so-and-so. They kind of had a hit it with a hammer sense. Everything was much more solid, a little bit more tactile in their approach. And they had kind of a fun vibe. They were definitely willing to poke at people, tease people and go back and forth on tribe issues. They were very people balanced in ways that the deciders just are not. The Savior Feminine Extroverted Sensors, on the other hand, they also seemed very outwardly focused, very comfortable with just stuff happening, but they had a very gentle approach. There was a softness to their presentation where they responded to the world by sort of maneuvering with it rather than against it. Their identity seemed a little bit more low key. They were sort of more aware of their identity, not necessarily a lot of tribe conflict but they also weren't emotionally wrecked by conflict that happened. There were, again, lots of real world stories, but the details were a little bit less specific and they were more willing to let other people guide the conversation. The Savior Masculine Introverted Sensors tended to double down on specifics and make lists of things to do. They were assertive, but more tribe balanced. They were not interested in new experiences and they were thrown off by responsibility or stuff messing up. They were definitely thrown off by chaos. They also kind of had a management vibe where they're like, we need to make this thing happen. This is how we do it. We are going to control the stuff. Not really a dreamer, more of a manager. They also didn't seem to do eye contact the way that other people that I've seen do. Maybe this is applies to kind of all sensors a little bit. With the deciders, they would either lock eyes with their interviewer or they were very focused on the audience if they were an introvert versus an extrovert. Whereas with the sensor types, there seemed to be like a little bit of eye contact, a little bit of focus on a person, but then they really drifted away pretty quickly. The Savior Feminine Introverted Sensors had this gentle awkwardness about them. They were reluctant to engage with the tribe. They really kind of preferred their own experience, and they were processing that internal experience in a lot of detail without necessarily being able to explain it well. They cared a lot about talking. They weren't really able to put their experiences into concepts. They seemed to do pretty well with one-on-one -on -one interactions. And both the masculine and feminine introverted sensors seemed to be a little bit more blasty, where they kind of wanted to just tell you stories and they could not wait to share their own personal information. Some questions for the comments. What are the advantages and disadvantages of having a personality that is focused on reality? What made the sensing types happiest and what made them saddest? And are double deciders better at dealing with people than single deciders? Thank you so much for watching. Please give feedback if you can. Let me know if this is helpful and what topics you would like to see covered. Thanks and good luck out there.